Hey everyone, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? I pray and hope that you're doing well. I, I think that old hymn that says, it is well with my soul. I want to tell you something, it is well with my soul and I hope it is well with your soul. We're praying for you. We love you. We miss you and can't wait till we are together again. Uh, but thanks for jump, jumping online here with us in our live stream today. And I just believe God has a word uh, for you. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited that, uh, that if we're going to be in quarantine, I'm, it might as well be in the spring. If we're going to have to be in a place where uh, there's a little bit of isolation, I'm glad we're moving into warm months so we can isolate outside and walk and, and ride bikes and do those kinds of things. I hope you're enjoying the spring season and all of God's blessing. I was thinking, you know, in our home, our house has become, and maybe this is a prayer request for me, but our house has become like a greenhouse. Uh, Patty is in full on uh, gardening mode. She is planting. She is, she's got little gardens going in the front. She has got little, uh, little egg crate things going on uh, it, uh, all around, inside, outside, where she's planted little seeds and, and is watching them and nurturing them and there's these little fragile little things coming up through the ground and she's so excited about it. And she'll, in fact, the other day she called me outside. Oh, come on, Gary, come outside. And I ran out there and I'm looking over her shoulder as she's pointing to the ground. There's the celery and there's the carrots and, and there's the cilantro and there's, and she's all, it all looks the same to me. I just side note, but I'm celebrating with her and excited about the growth that is, and here's the deal. Growth is taking place. Those plants do not care that there's a pandemic. Those plants are, do not care that we're in quarantine. They're coming up. They're doing what they were designed to do. And, and make no mistake, there's been a lot of work in the process. Patty's been tilling and, and moving them outside when it's nice and warm, bringing them back inside when it gets cool, and, and just nurturing and loving those things and actually talking to them a little bit, which could, that's another conversation, but she's talking to them and nurturing them along and, and it's been awesome. And I, I just got to thinking, I wonder if the same should be said about how we're doing in this season. Are we growing? Are you growing? In fact, a great question to ask in this season is how are you growing? And rather than how you're doing is how are you growing? How are you moving your life forward in this season, moving along, last week we talked about anticipation uh, or anticipate today what God will do tomorrow. That word anticipate is the word expect, expect today what God is going to do tomorrow. Prophesy about it, uh, believe for it, lean into it, count on it, bank on it, apprehend it. It's going to happen. These are not days to just lean back and, uh, uh, and just sort of sit back and not... Uh, not really give thought or, or do the hard work of growth. We need to lean into it and say, Jesus, help me to grow in this season. In fact, we've been uh, laced through this, uh, this series. We've, we've, uh, we've uh, been speaking out of Isaiah chapter 43, and it says this, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Do you not perceive it? Which says, which infers that, you know what? I could miss it. I could miss it. God's saying, do you see it? Uh, do you see it in the middle of quarantine? Do you see it in the middle of this virus? Do you see it in the middle of Governor Inslee's new, uh, new statement or wherever you're living? Do you, do you see it? He says, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And embedded in this message, it reminds us, it's a reminder that God is doing new things. It's a reminder to us that we're not to settle for the same old, same old. And it's a critical reminder, and I want you to hear this closely, that God is creating pathways. Or listen, he's a God who creates pathways and he creates places of refreshment, streams of refreshment in unlikely places. Unlikely places. So the, the caution is don't just, don't just kind of push this time aside. Say, Jesus, what is it? What are you speaking? What do you want me to learn? How do you want me to grow in this season? And I know some of you are there right now. You're in a wilderness. You're in a, you're in a barren place. Some of you have said, yeah, I'm, we're just tired. You know, I'm, I'm tired. I, 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 don't, 
I don't know that I've got much more. And I listen, and I'm not just talking about quarantine and COVID-19. I'm talking about just life. There's some struggle. There's some trial that you're walking through and you're, and you're weary. And I'm saying, and, and God is saying, look for it in unlikely places. I'm bringing streams of refreshment your way. But today I want to ask the question, and I want us to wrestle together with, how do I anticipate a bright future uh, when today seems so dark, when what I'm walking through now is so difficult? How do I apprehend a, a new tomorrow when today's filled with setbacks and hardships and delays? I feel like God has maybe lost sight of me. So in fact, you're taking notes, write this down, anticipation through trial. How do we anticipate what God's doing through trials. And number one, I'm just going to give you the first one right out of the gate. And let me just warn you, it may not sound all that exciting at first, but hang with me. Number one, write this down. Recognize believers are not exempt from trials. Believers are not exempt from struggle. We, we, we all could struggle in some ways and walk through difficult seasons, dark seasons. Believers are not exempt from those seasons. One author puts it this way. Uh, she says, chances are you are facing a trial you simply don't understand today. Light winds have become stormy gales and you're unsure about your circumstances. It may be the capsizing kind, like infertility or cancer or wounding from a friend, broken family relationships or the loss of a dream. Or maybe not so severe, but it rocks your boat nonetheless, like a stubborn child who tests your patience or a long season of waiting, a long season of waiting. And there's this guy in the Bible that from outward appearances, it seems like this guy just mastered walking through difficult seasons. Some of them were self-imposed. We've all been there. And some of them were just by virtue of life. Uh, as, a young, as a young boy, David, I'm talking about David. David as a young boy, I mean, his, and, and throughout his life, David's highlight reel was impressive. But his low light reel, his like the stuff that, like tough stuff that he walked through, like could have been the fodder of TMZ. Uh, uh, but David was a, a young shepherd boy. Uh, and he was out just minding his own business. And just tending his sheep, killing lions and bears, and 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 uh, watching over what God entrusted his dad, his dad entrusted him to. But God was ministering to him, and he was out writing songs of worship and falling in love with the Lord. Meanwhile, back at the at, at the palace, King Saul is he's struggling. In fact, he's failing miserably. His kingdom has been revoked for all intents. And purposes and, and his anointing as the Spirit of God is lifted from his life. And God speaks to the prophet of the day, Samuel. And he says, Samuel, I, 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 wanna, I, I need to select a new king. I want you to go to Bethlehem and I want you to go to Jesse's house. He's got a, Jesse's house, he's got a lot of sons, he's got a lot of boys. And I'm going to show you which son is going to be the next king. And so uh, Samuel does that. He makes his way to Bethlehem, goes to Jesse's house. He says, Jesse, you're, you're, there's going to be a king from your household. Uh, I need to see your sons. And so uh, he begins to run alongside of, in front of Samuel, the various sons. In fact, when, when Samuel sees Eliab, uh, there's this interesting conversation that goes on between God and Samuel. And, and it, it's something like this. Eliab was like a studly dude, right? Big guy. And, and, and Samuel goes, surely this is God's anointing. This has got to be the guy. And God whispers into Samuel's ear. Listen, you, you, uh, you guys look at, man looks at the outward appearance. But I want to tell you something. God looks at the heart. I look at the heart. And uh, I've not, I've rejected this guy. No. So, so one after the other, they all walk in front of Samuel and God says, no, 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 no. Seven uh, sons have gone through and none of them. Jesse looks at, uh, or Samuel looks at Jesse and he says, is there another? And, and Jesse says, yeah, I got one out and he's tending sheep. It's just a young kid. I, I just assumed it would be one of these guys. And, and, and Samuel says, oh, I'm going to wait here. I'm not going anywhere till you go get him. And they bring David up and they bring him in. And, and David stands before the prophet of God. Imagine this moment. His family standing around 
Jesse and the seven brothers who were rejected. And look what it says in 1 Samuel 16, verse 12. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and he anointed, just poured it over David's head, anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And then Samuel returned to Ramah. What a, what a powerful moment as the spirit of God, as God selects David as king. Imagine just David now he's full of oil and he's walking like, what, what, what was said at that moment? I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in that moment. The Spirit of God has come upon David. Uh, the Spirit of God has, has been removed from King Saul. But King Saul has no idea this is going on. In fact, Saul is so tormented by an evil spirit that, that uh, he was looking for a musician to play in his court. In fact, Hebrew culture, ancient Hebrew culture, believed that if you had a music playing, uh, that, that would, it would just calm and, and sort of alleviate the, the, the anxiety and the agitation. And so they, somebody told him about David. He, was, he could play well. So they called David, invited him in, and David would play the harp uh, for King Saul. Little did they realize that David was an anointed worshiper of Jesus. And so he would play, and that evil spirit would be driven from that place. And I want to just say, just a side note here, like if you're walking through whatever season, whatever, wherever you are, season of darkness, there's something powerful to be said about anointed worship. I mean, hey, smooth jazz is smooth jazz, and that's kind of cool and fun and all that, and planes, you know, like the oldies and whatever, it's good music, but there's nothing that's powerful, nothing that will drive away darkness like anointed worship. So I just, sometimes I'll just play, I'll find uh, on Spotify, just worship to the Lord and begin to play it and let it just go, just, just run over my soul. And I want to encourage you to do the same in this season. To just go on to YouTube, find some of our worship, our worship teams, uh, worship songs, and just play them loudly in your home and just allow the Spirit of God to drive out the darkness. That, that's what David brought to the king and to those moments when he was, he was agitated. And God began to give us, uh, David favor with Saul and began to rise up and grow up in that court and just begin to, uh, begin to uh, uh, calm, not only just calm that spirit in Saul, but again, begin to just find favor in the eyes of the king. Look at 1 Samuel 16. David came to Saul, entered his service. Saul liked him very much. And David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse saying, allow David to remain in my service for I am pleased with him. And whenever the spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul and he would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. So David's growing in in favor with God and man, and he faces the giant. I'm just going to summarize his life. He faces the giant Goliath and defeats him. Now he's in his early 20s. He becomes joins Saul's army. There are military conquests that David wins, and he begins to rise in popularity. In fact, one day as Saul and David were coming in into the city, the women began to cheer out loud, and the, the crowds began to cheer, Saul has slain his thousands, and David, his his ten, his ten thousands. It was an amazing moment. But, but Saul, as he's hearing that song, is something in his head flipped. Something, there was a switch that, that, that was triggered. And all of a sudden, from that day forward, he began to feel threatened and enraged with jealousy. And as you follow the, their journey, even as David's playing worship music in Saul's court, on three occasions, Saul tries to take him out with his spear and, 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 and pin him to the wall. It's just uh, this, this crazy, uh, this crazy uh, jealousy uh, and agitation toward David began to fill his life. Look at 1 Samuel 18. It says, when Saul realized that the Lord was with David and how much his daughter Michael loved him, Saul became even more afraid of him and he remained David's enemy for the rest of his life. 
And the, and the remainder of the book of 1 Samuel is a picture of David running from Saul, Saul chasing David with reckless abandon. Uh, uh, killing David becomes the preoccupation of his life, his obsession. You talk about unjust. You talk about just, this is not fair. I mean, David's only crime was being selected king, being an anointed worshiper of God, uh, uh, being a great warrior, and doing whatever he could to help uh, uh, Saul and, and the people of God. And now we find him hiding out in cliffs and crags and caves. He's treated with disdain. He's hunted like a wild animal. At one point, he had to, he had to feign, he had to pretend he was a, a, a lunatic, a crazed lunatic, while, while hiding out in, in, with, with the Philistines because they, were rec they recognized him. So he had to pretend he was a crazy man. And this is, this is the Bible at its raw and real best. This is, this is the Bible not trying to hide that believers in God, men and women of God, often have walked through difficult and dark season. In fact, while running from Saul, there are at least five psalms that have been written, that were written by David during the time he was trying to hide out and run from Saul. And uh, look at this one with me, Psalm 7, uh, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. It says, O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver Look at Psalm 31, 9. It says, be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. He's like in his 20s here. For my soul is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. I mean, this is the guy who just, just like a few chapters ago was like singing worship in the local coffee, in the local cafe, right? The, the anointed songs of worship in the king's court. Now he's hiding for his life almost for a decade. We find he's running and the lesson is believers are not exempt from pain and trials and dark seasons. In fact, it was the great artistic cinematic classic Princess Bride where we find this quote. It says, life is pain, highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. Yeah, yeah, let me just say, the Bible is not selling something. But because we live in a fallen world and that we are subject to the law of sowing and reaping, we will still experience our fair share of pain and suffering in this life. The Bible says uh, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. There, there's going to be hardship, but take heart. I have overcome the world, there's two parts in that, that, that passage that, that we, have to, we have to think about and look at. You will have trouble, Jesus said it himself, that's a reality. But take heart, I've overcome the world. There's a faith component there that we gotta keep our, keep our head up and have faith in God that he's gonna get us through it because he's overcome, he's overcome. James 1 a uh, great passage that talks about struggle and trial. Uh, James writes, he says, consider it pure joy. And what's the next word? Uh, he didn't say, consider it pure joy if you encounter various trials. He didn't say, should you encounter various trials. He didn't say, consider it pure joy in the event you encounter. No, he said, consider it pure joy when. When you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, lacking nothing. So we're going to walk through the struggle, but here's the good news. Write this down, number two, that no better, there's no better place to learn God's grace. No better place to learn God's grace. In the middle of a struggle, middle of a trial, say it out loud. In fact, if you could repeat after me right there in your living room with your family, say it with me, or say it after me. No better place to learn God's grace. To learn, no better place to learn God's grace. And in the middle of the struggle, 
And not so much, hey, listen, there's going to be plenty of grace on the other side of the struggle. But right now, in the middle is when you can learn most about the grace of God. Tim Keller gives a, an amazing, just a great commentary on Psalm 88. And uh, I'm not gonna, we're not going to elaborate Psalm 88 other than to say this. Psalm 88 is one of those psalms that, is, that it begins, it's a psalm that begins in darkness and it ends like 14 verses later, it ends in, a, in difficulty and struggle and trial. Many of the psalms... Um, will have struggle in them. And at the end of the psalm, it'll kind of come out with some great, you know, uh, uh, declaration like, but you, O Lord, are my strength and you, O Lord, are my song. And yet, Lord, I will trust in you. And, but not Psalm 88. It's, it's, it begins dark and it ends dark. In fact, I want to read just a couple of, of verses to you from it. Uh, verse three says, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. I'm counted with those who go down to the pit. I am like a man who has no strength. Uh, look at verse um, 14 or verse 18. He says, I'm lo a loved one and friend you have put far from me and my acquaintances into darkness. And uh, uh, Keller comments on this, on this psalm. He says it's like, a, it's like an interrogation to God, this prayer. It's, sar it's sarcastic, rhetorical questions. Like, I want to tell the world about you. How can I tell them if I'm dead? And he almost comes close to saying, like, like a child, answer me, answer me, like pounding on the chest of God, saying, answer me. He's not being respectful. He's exaggerating statements. It's, from my youth, all my life, I've been in danger. You've never been there for me, not once. Never been there for me, not once. And I mean, you know, there's a tendency for us to do that. That we read everything in our life through that moment. And you're never there for me. You're, you're there for them. You're there for, but what about me? What about us? What about our struggle? God, where are you? Answer me, God. Answer me. And he ends the, the psalm by saying, darkness is a better friend than you are right now. Why, why do you suppose this prayer is in the Bible? It's a great question to ask. It's so dark. It's so negative. One commentator, Derek Kidner, answers, he responds by saying this. He says, the very presence of these prayers in Scripture is a witness to God's understanding. God knows how men speak when they are desperate. God knows. See, God put the prayer in there. God didn't say, I don't want that in my Bible. I'd rather have all the positive. No, he, he, he put that in the Bible. God put it there. God is identifying with us when we are desperate. God is saying, I am the Lord of this man because I am the God of grace. I am your God, not because you say or do everything right, but because I am the God of grace. We learn so much more about the grace of God in dark times than even we do in times of prosperity, when everything seems to be going well, when everything is going right. I recall this as a, as a young boy growing up in my home. I learned quickly that we were subject, it's a, it was a, we were a Christian home, we loved the Lord, but we experienced difficult storms and, and a lot of struggle and a lot of hardship as a family. I watched my parents sort of try to wrestle through some horrific storms, trying to navigate and get us through and try to cover the young family as we were, as we were walking through. Yet in all the trials and all of the storms, and there were many, uh, there was never a point, there was never a place in my life where I I raised my fist at God and, and felt like I just needed to blame him. My parents tried to navigate as best they could. I wasn't turned off to the reality of a savior who loved me and loved my family because, because we walked through hardship. I, no, I wasn't put off to that God. No, I, I was drawn to him. I was drawn to the God of grace. At the end of the day, it wasn't the turmoil we faced as a young family that gripped my heart. It, no, it was the God of, it was the God of grace. I know the enemy tried to knock us down and knock us out for years, storm after storm. But we only learned to trust in the God of grace more deeply 
with each passing storm. Why? Because we were special? No. Because I, I just remember my parents would do everything they could. And even when they couldn't keep, the, keep it all together, when they couldn't navigate and, and keep us covered and keep us the way they wanted to, they pointed us in the direction of the God of grace. My mom would, uh, my mom was uh, very involved in our church, my mom and dad, uh, very musical. And my mom would often sing, beautiful voice. She would sing specials in our church. And I'll never forget just being a young boy, feeling so much pride in my heart when my mom would sing. And uh, what, what people didn't see is that at home she'd practice those songs and maybe be in the bedroom and I could hear her singing. And those songs, listen, you don't think your kids are listening? You don't think your kids are watching, mom and dad? There were things that just got into my spirit, even subliminally, by the, I think by the power of the Holy Spirit. I could hear my mom to this day in my head, in my, in my head singing, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. She sang these words. She said, I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and sorrow from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. I'll never forget her singing, through it all, through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon his word. I want to tell you something. Those lyrics to that, those songs, when I, when I just close my eyes and I listen in my heart to those words, those songs, I hear my mom singing. What am I saying? I'm not saying moms and dads, you got to become singers. But I'm saying as we demonstrate before our kids a faith and a resilience in God that we're going to lean in, in him during storms, those those will be deposits into the hearts of your children that they will never forget. So keep on singing, keep on praying. So we're, we're gonna walk through, we're not exempt from trials as believers. Secondly, there's no better place to learn God's grace than in the middle of a struggle. Let me give you the last one. The last one is this, in seasons of suffering, they're gonna produce the greatest fruit. Seasons of suffering will produce the greatest fruit. I want to encourage you with this today, that on the other side of this season of suffering, there's joy. On the other side of this season of hardship, there's a harvest. There's growth. There's maturity. There's character that's being built. There's wisdom. There's, there's hope. There's hope that God is still writing a storyline. God is, listen, God is still writing. He's rewriting your future. He's doing it now. Hang on. Have, have faith. Hold on to him. As long as you have breath, the final chapter of your life is yet to be written. You lean into the storm and watch what God does. This was certainly the case for David. David went through all that he went through, storm after storm after storm, things he didn't deserve. And look at 2 Samuel chapter 5 with me. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned for 40 years. And David built the city all around from Milo to uh, inward. Verse 10, watch this. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. Say, God of hosts was with him. Oh, the God of hosts was with him? You mean uh, as soon as he took the throne? No. The God of hosts was with him all the way through his journey when he was out in the field tending sheep, killing bears, lions, worshiping Jesus. The God of hope was with him all the way through when he was uh, uh, running and hiding in crags and caves and cliffs. He was with him. He saw in, in God's, God's, uh, uh, with God's vision, he saw David. Uh, he saw the future David, the David that, that would yet become and, and fulfill the plan. 
and the plans and purposes for David's life. David would go from tending sheep to tending the people of Israel. You want a definition of good to great? There it is for you. Tending sheep to tending the people of Israel. But oftentimes, everyone, listen, oftentimes it requires that we journey through the dark night of the soul. Oftentimes we have to walk through and navigate difficult season, seasons and delays and delays, unmet expectations, or kids who turn their back on God, or a diagnosis that kind of rocks our world. I want to tell you something. Whatever you're walking through, trust the God of grace. Hang on to the God of grace. There's a harvest. There's a harvest. The Bible says, in due season, you will reap a harvest if you don't faint, if you don't faint. Mother Teresa devoted her life to loving the sick, the poor, and the dying in the slums of Calcutta, India. We know her life journey and story is amazing, the way she served people. In 1979, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. In 2003, she was honored honored by the Catholic Church With those kinds of accolades, it's easy to think of her as existing in a category by herself. Beyond doubt, maybe beyond discouragement. But Mother Teresa's private diaries tell a different story. She wrote these words, listen closely. She said, I am told God lives in me. And yet the reality of darkness and coldness and emptiness is so great that nothing touches my soul. Wow. Mother Teresa said that. Nothing touches my soul. In fact, I was thinking back. uh, It sounds very much like Job. This week, Patty and I were praying. We've been praying at the 714s, 714 a.m. and 714 p.m. We'll just kneel and, and just seek God together for our nation, for the world. And this week, I think it might, might have been Tuesday morning, I just asked her to pray for me. I said, Patty, I, I just don't, I'm not feeling right now. I feel, I, I really couldn't even define it. I just said, I, I, I don't feel like there's so much going on here, but it's not hitting here. So she just laid her hands on me and just began to pray over my life. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you just don't feel. Maybe it's something, feels like there's a disconnect, a dry season, or so much difficulty that you're having trouble finding communion with God. The story goes on of Mother Teresa. Her story sounds a little bit like Job, her comment in, in her diary. Even Jesus, though, said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When when Jesus was on the cross, he felt farthest from the heavenly Father, yet that is when he was closest to accomplishing God's purposes. So we shouldn't be deceived when it seems as if God is letting us down. He is setting us up for something that may be beyond our ability to comprehend at the present moment. What if that's what God is doing in your life? What if that's what's going on In many lives, those who are seeking God maybe feel dry in this season. Now, I don't know if this is uh, heartening or disheartening, but it may be a little bit of both. But listen, if Mother Teresa could experience and wasn't immune to dark nights of the soul, we probably won't be either. If Jesus uh, had moments when the Father felt distant, probably uh, we will too. I love the quote Mark Batterson says, faith isn't flying above the storm, it's weathering the storm. It's trusting God's heart even when we can't see his hand. It's understanding that sometimes the obstacle is the way. The obstacle is the way. I think maybe Jesus felt that in the garden. When he prayed, Father, would you let this cup pass from me? And then he said, yet not my will, but yours be done. He was on his way to the cross. The difficult place was 
getting to the cross, but he was fixed and focused on getting there. The obstacle was the way. And he leaned into it. And he moved forward. And I'm so glad he did. Today, we're going to receive communion together. I'm going to ask you to just go ahead and grab your, uh, your bread and your juice. And we're going to receive in this moment and give thanks to the Lord for what he's done and what he's doing in our lives. I was thinking that his body was broken for us and maybe you're watching this today and you found this place and you're away from God or maybe you don't have a relationship with God. I want you to know that communion represents us being reminded of what he did for us. Your sin, my sin, nailed to a cross. He paid the price for us. What I, I deserved that punishment. He took it for me. He said, Gary, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to cast that sin as far as the east is from the west. I'm going to throw your sin into the sea of forgetfulness. It's gone. It's done. Why? By the, by the sacrifice that happened on the cross. He says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes. And it's a reminder to the enemy who tries to torment and tries to tear you down and pull you apart and tell you, you don't have a future. Listen, communion reminds us we do, reminds us we do have a future in Christ because of the price that was paid for you and for me. So would you lift that bread up and can we just thank God together for his body that was broken for us. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for going to the cross for me. Thank you for not shirking the pain and the suffering. Thank you for leaning into it because, because you did, Lord, I can. Because you did, you endured, I, I know I'm able to. Because you paid the price, Lord. I'm able to walk in freedom and in joy and in victory today. So we receive this bread today with gratitude of heart. In Jesus' name, let's receive the bread together. And then come on, just in your living room. I wish I could... I wish I could just be there and see you lifting that cup. Let's just thank Jesus for what it symbolizes. It symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ that takes away the sin of the world. Lord, thank you. By your stripes we were healed blood that flowed that day down Calvary's cross was the purchase for my sin. Thank you that you endured the cross. You despised its shame. But for the joy set before you, your word says you endured the cross. So thank you. Thank you for the joy that we can experience today because of that sacrifice. We receive this with joy and gladness of heart. In Jesus' name, let's receive the juice together. Just before the band comes back and they're going to lead us in a song, Living Hope, just get ready to, to conclude our time together in lifting our voices in song to the Lord. I want to read something to you that I think is a great quote. Let me just review. Believers are not exempt from trials. There's no better place to learn God's grace than in the trial, in the struggle. And seasons of suffering will produce the greatest fruit. I believe it. I believe it. And listen, Rick Renner, Rick Renner was quoted as saying, somewhere along the way, in order to see your dream accomplished, you're going to have to dig in your heels and say, I don't care how heavy the load gets, how hot the fire blazes, how turbulent the storm or how dark the sky. I am standing on the word that God has spoken to me and I won't budge until I see it come to pass. Let it come to pass. Lord, let it be. Let it come by your hand and your will and your way. 
in Jesus' name. God bless you, Legacy. Have a great week.